Hey, it's the Analytics Dude, back again with another Statistics Live video. This one I'm calling the Coronavirus Edition, aka the lockdown of your friends who struggled to get C's in high school math and now explaining the ins and outs of epidemiological modeling to you. In this video, I'm going to show you a couple of data visualizations that I consider to be highly misleading, and I'll explain why I think that's the case. If that's the sort of thing you like, please subscribe here and also check out my site, theanalyticsdude.com, where I have a couple of other things to help you identify when you might be being misled. And as always, I appreciate the likes. This first graph here belongs in the Hall of Fame for misleading graphs. Now, it takes a bit of looking at first, but there are a couple things that they do to create a graph with a perfect trend. In fact, perfect trend should be a first warning sign. Real world data is messy. First, they show the dates out of order. The x-axis is arranged to make each day display in a descending order, so the 26th of April is near the end instead of the beginning. They also have the bars in different orders in every single day, which takes away from the variability from county to county. The fact is, different counties have different new cases on different days. That's a fact of life. I took the liberty to rearrange the graph in an accurate manner. The thing is, they didn't really need to rearrange the graph to tell a declining story. The actual story shows the same thing, a declining trend, it's just not as neat as the original graph would lead you to believe. While the first graph is obviously misleading if you look at the x-axis, the second one seems pretty logical at first. What I'm talking about is showing COVID-19 cases adjusted for a country's population. This one's a little old and hasn't aged all that well, but it seems pretty logical. A larger country should have more COVID-19 cases, right? Well, no, actually. If you're looking at things after the pandemic is over, adjusting the total number of cases for population is a totally reasonable way to look at things. If you're looking at it while the pandemic is going on or while it's growing, the growth rate is the only important factor. Adjusting any of that for population is just going to be misleading. Here's an example why. Imagine there is an algae infection that's infecting freshwater lakes. In our example, we'll compare what happens to two lakes of different sizes that both get infected on the same day. Our first lake is the largest freshwater lake in the entire world by surface area. Lake Superior, over 82,000 square kilometers of surface area. Our other lake is Lake Okeechobee, the largest freshwater lake in Florida where I live, at 1,800 square kilometers. In both lakes, the algae starts with one square meter on the same day. It's a very aggressive algae. It doubles in size every day. It grows in an exponent of 2.0. Now let's say Lake Okeechobee actually realized something was wrong and deployed an algae killer decreasing its growth to an exponent of 1.9. Well, after 20 days, 10% of Lake Okeechobee's entire surface would be covered, while only 0.64% of Lake Superior's surface would be covered. So despite Lake Okeechobee actually doing a better job of, of managing the infection, it grows slower there because they deployed the algae killer, its infection is over 10 times worse than Lake Superior's if you look in terms of the total surface area. That's because the growth of the infection is independent of the total size. That's why this is misleading. It's the same concept when measuring the pandemic. Like the algae, that it starts from one individual, a patient zero. Knowing the percentage of the population that's infected doesn't tell you how well the country is or is not managing the disease. It just tells you how far it's progressed to date. It also doesn't tell you how bad it'll get. The r naught or growth rate is the only thing that can tell you that. That's the math behind why the CDC or the WHO tells you about flattening the curve. If you're wondering why I said this graph hasn't aged well, it's because on March 28th, the US was near the bottom of the list while Belgium was at the top. On May 17th, the US and Belgium are in a virtual tie for the top place on the list, with an almost identical percentage of the population that's tested positive for the coronavirus infection. There's also the problem of how the data is captured for a test like this. Different countries have different tests, different testing protocols, different testing availability, different lag time before positive results come out, different reporting requirements, and such it's very difficult to make a comparison across countries here, including the fact that some countries have vastly different testing procedures from region to region, like here in the US. I hope this helps identify things that you know could be misleading you. If you like this content, please subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. And also check out my site, theanalyticsdude.com. And uh, there's a man named Carl T. Bergstrom who teaches a course called Calling Bullshit at the University of Washington. He's very active on Twitter and shows lots of examples just like this um, that are really excellent. As always, until next time, I'm the Analytics Dude. Thanks for watching.